Hello, brothers and sisters. Very nice to see you on this Sunday morning on the Lord's Day. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the gift that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the payment that the sinless one made for all of us, that we might live with you forever. And so, Lord, we also ask that you help us to uh, keep away from distractions that would take us our eyes off of you. Help us to follow you and follow you closely. In Jesus' name, amen. For our scripture reading this morning, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, starting with verse 20. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. There's a TV series called Monk. Some of you have probably seen it. In one of the episodes, Monk, well, let's talk about Monk for a minute. He has a lot of phobias. He's afraid of heights, elevators, shaking hands, dirt of all kinds, garbage, uh, and probably a list that would take up two or three pages. Um, so he's got a lot of problems. Anything out of place, he's got to fix it. So in this one episode, he and his assistant are uh, spectators at a marathon race and one of the runners is a hero of monks that he saw a couple decades earlier and uh, had a real wonderful one, uh, run and won and so uh, he's he's revered him for years he's running today now he's 63 and monk wants to see his hero however during the run a monk has his binoculars all set to go and uh, then he sees a man not far down the line there that has his sweater buttoned wrong. And Monk can't take that. He's got to fix it. So he makes his way over to the man and he says, you know, let me help you. Let me help you fix this. He said, I know how to button real good. And, and he starts to fiddle with him. And the man is going, I want to see the race. He didn't care about his buttons, how his shirt was buttoned. But Monk, with the flailing of the man's arms and his protests, he still managed to unbutton the wrong buttons and make it all right. When he gets back by his assistant, she says, Monk, you missed it. He ran by. It's over. You missed the moment. It's very easy for us to miss moments with Christ and to miss uh, that closeness with Jesus because we do get distracted by many things. All kinds of things happening. Of course, now everybody's pretty pretty slow. We're staying home and uh, not going as many places as we were. We have a little more time to think and maybe a little bit less distracted. Um, so we want to look at some of the folks that saw Jesus after his resurrection. Jesus spent 40 uh, days uh, on you know visiting his disciples and teaching them in those 40 days and then he ascended to heaven and so during that 40 days he saw quite a few people he saw Mary Magdalene uh, Mary by the way Mary was a very popular name at the time there's quite a few of them in the Bible Mary the mother of Jesus uh, Salome she brought spices to anoint Jesus body two disciples were walking in the country when Jesus joined them uh, the 11 Jesus visited them a couple times. 500 people saw him at one time. 
James, Jesus' brother, saw him, and Peter did. Jesus made a special visit to Peter. He kind of needed that. And then Paul says he also saw him on the way to Damascus when Jesus spoke to him and gave him his call to ministry. So we're just going to look at a few because we uh, don't have all the time in the world to um, explore all these wonderful things. The Bible's full of treasures. We're going to look at Mary Magdalene first. She was the first one to see the resurrected Christ. It was an honor beyond all. It was awesome what happened. Now, Mary Magdalene has often been called a, a prostitute. Did you know that there's absolutely no evidence anywhere in history that she was a prostitute? The Bible does tell us that Mary Magdalene and other women who followed Jesus and the disciples and ministered to Jesus, supplying his needs of food and, and whatever ne uh, needed to be supplied, um, they were women of means. They had uh, money. And um, she was one of the women that followed him because all of these women had been healed and delivered by Jesus. Now it says uh, he cast demons out and healed them of their infirmities. So Mary Magdalene is one of those women. Now what her problems were we don't know, but Jesus cast seven demons out of her. Whatever her uh, problems were, whether it was problems of the mind uh, or infirmities, when the woman was, when another woman was hunched over and bent over for 18 years and could not stand, uh, said to Jesus, cast that demon out of her. And so often um, infirmities, deafness and so on, and other things uh, were considered demon possession. So Mary had seven demons in her that Jesus cast out. Now can you imagine the peace of mind that she had when she was delivered? Can you imagine how good she felt in her body if she had been healed of infirmities besides? And so because of that, she loved Jesus and so did these other women who ministered to him. So Mary Magdalene was one that we're looking at today who did not let any distractions take her away from following Jesus. She followed Jesus from Galilee uh, to Jerusalem she and some of these other women, to uh, meet their needs. And so she saw from afar the crucifixion. She was at the cross with uh, Jesus' mother Mary and other women who were there with her also. She watched when Joseph of Arimathea uh, got the body of Jesus from Pontius Pilate, and she watched where he took Jesus and where he buried Jesus. And he, she watched the stone being rolled into place in front of the open tomb. And so she was there on that resurrection morning. And uh, she was with some other women and they were wondering uh, about how, that, how they were going to get in to put these spices on Jesus' body, as was the custom, with the stone in front of the tomb. And so you know that the stone was already rolled away when they got there. The interesting thing is that Mary Magdalene went and ran to Peter and John and she told them that the tomb was empty and they went she said I don't know where where he is but the tomb is empty and these angels said that he's risen from the dead uh, Peter and John go and when John sees the empty grave clothes there on that grave slab, um, he believes right away that Jesus is risen from the dead. Peter is still not too sure. But anyway, Peter and John go back home. But Mary Magdalene stays alone at the tomb. And we have this experience. She stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. 
He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Now you'll notice that Jesus asks a lot of questions, and when he does that, he is not looking for the answer because he doesn't know it. He's looking for the person who's asking the question to understand what's going on and what the questions really are. And so he says, uh, who is it you're looking for? So she thought he was the gardener, and she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you've put him, and I'll get him. Then Jesus said one word to her, Mary. And when that word was uttered, she knew it was Jesus. And through her tear-filled eyes, she looked at the master, and she cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher. And she turned toward him, and she worshipped him. The first one to see the resurrected Christ. Now, if you had been delivered from seven demons, been healed, delivered, set free, consider. Now, look at, look at the reality of what I just said. You and I, who have accepted Christ as our Savior, we have been delivered from a myriad of things. Some of you have been delivered from addiction. Some of you have been healed. But all of us have been set free from our sin and unbelief and the empty world of no faith. I consider it an emptiness. And I consider when a person comes to faith, they come into the wide open fields of faith. Praise his holy name. So these two men on the road to Emmaus, they were two disciples. And they weren't part of the twelve, but they were part of that close group. And um, they were going, taking a seven-mile walk, headed for Emmaus. And while they were walking, they were discussing the terrible things that had just happened with Jesus. And Jesus joins them, though they don't know it is Jesus. And he asked them, and now he's asking another question. He knows the answer. What are you discussing together as you walk along? He asked them. And they stood still stopped where they were, and their faces were sad, and, and they had been so disappointed and crushed and in grief over what had happened to Jesus. And so one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to death, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You see, they had that hope. And now he's, you know, their hopes were dashed to the ground at the crucifixion. They thought he was going to restore Israel, restore its kingdom, get out from under Roman rule. And what, what a disappointment and earth-shattering event had just taken place. And so um, he, they go on and they say, well, some of the women went to the tomb and they said he wasn't there. And some angels said that he was risen. And, and, um, but, you know, a couple of, of the disciples went and, and they found the empty tomb, but they didn't see Jesus. And they didn't believe the women. Now Jesus says to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them as they walked along what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. And then... When they invited him to stop and, uh, and spend the night there at their home, they were eating supper. And Jesus was the one who blessed the bread and break it. And when he did that, they recognized him. It was Jesus. And as soon as they recognized him, he was gone. He disappeared. And so now these two disciples, they make their way back that seven miles to Jerusalem and they tell their story to the disciples. We have seen him. 
He is alive. What were these two distracted by? They were distracted from, from faith because of their lack of understanding of the scriptures. And their uh, conjecture that Jesus was going to deliver the kingdom back to Israel. They had some false understandings and they couldn't really get it out of their heads. But as they were walking along and Jesus was explaining, they were beginning, they were starting to understand. And when they were all done and walking back to Jerusalem, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he explained to us the scriptures? And so you see, there are times, uh, brothers and sisters, when, when we too have um, lost our way, so to speak, and been distracted because God didn't do what we thought he should do. And that's going to happen because God knows he knows all things. And you and I are a bit limited in that category. And so there are times when, when we just need to um, trust God, even though we don't understand. And trust his word. Believe in him and have faith in him. He knows what he's doing. And he loves you. And he cares about you. We want to end with Peter. We left Peter weeping bitterly on Good Friday because he had denied that he knew Jesus three times. His biggest disappointment probably was that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. So he was distracted really by his own strength, his own pride. And we can be distracted by those things too. So anyway, one of the uh, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection was down by the seashore. Peter said one day to the guys, uh, five or six of them went with him. He said, I'm going fishing. They said, oh, we'll go with you. So they went down to the sea and they went out and they fished all night. In the early dawn, they see a man on the seashore and he asks the common question that you ask of fishermen. Did you catch any fish? And they shouted back, no, we fished all night and caught nothing. So then Jesus says to them, they don't know it's him, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They did what he said and the nets were full of fish, big fish. And when they got back to shore, they counted them. There were 153 large fish. It was a miraculous catch and the nets did not break. It was so awesome. They recognized the Lord, of course, when they got to the shore. Actually, John knew it was him when they were still on the boat, and he said to Peter, that's the Lord. Peter jumped in the water and swam to shore. Anyway, then Jesus got Peter alone, and he asked him this question. Peter, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you you know I love you. And then Jesus asked him the second time, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. You know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He asks Peter a third time, do you love me? Peter said, oh Lord, you know. You know all things. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So he is commissioning Peter and also he has given Peter three opportunities to show his love. And he had three denials of Christ. And now he's been able to tell Jesus he loves him three times. He has been reinstated. He has been put back into the graces. His relationship with Jesus is, is mended. Because you see, Jesus is forgiving. Aren't we glad? Aren't we glad that he is patient and he loves us and he welcomes us back always, always. So Peter needed to focus on following Christ. You notice in the scripture that was read, Peter looks back and he sees John and he says, what about him? And Jesus basically says, Peter, don't worry about him. You follow me. And this is a lesson for all of us to learn. We need not be distracted by other people. We need to be concerned and focused 
on what Christ wants us to do. Others are following him. They're doing what God's called them to do. But you and I need to keep our focus on Jesus and not be distracted by other things. Well, then we have the focus on the second coming. In the first chapter of Acts, we read something about that. And Jesus is about to say goodbye. He's going to ascend to the Father. And he says, you wait in Jerusalem until you are have received the gift of the Father, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power. But before he says that, the disciples ask him a question, and they want to know when all of these things are going to happen. He said, Lord, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking for that. They're still waiting for that. Jesus replies, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He wants them not to be distracted by these things that are not necessary for them to know. God knows. God's got his calendar. Everything is okay. God's never late. He's always on time. But he says, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. He has commissioned them but they need to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And so now they are not to be distracted by any of these other questions and things that they can't answer. You have questions about God and, and the end times and things that you don't have all the answers to. It's okay. It's okay. Study the Bible. Great. See what answers you can find. Super. But don't be distracted in what Christ has called you and me to do. And that is to be witnesses of him, of what he's done for us, the salvation he's brought to us, the deliverance he's brought to us. And let's be dedicated and keep ourselves and our eyes focused on Jesus. He's the author and finisher of the faith. Last words of Jesus are in Revelation, in the vision that John had. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Yes, I am coming soon. Now, some complain that Jesus has waited a long time to come back. I have an answer for that. Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and have eternal life. And besides that, if Jesus had come a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, you and I would not be part of the church. We wouldn't be here. So, we're glad he has not come yet, but he is coming soon. One day is like a thousand years to God and a thousand years as a day. So Jesus has only been gone about two days. And the third day might be coming real quick here. And he might appear anytime, today, tomorrow. We want to be ready. Behold, I am coming soon. Don't lose your focus. Amen.
Jesus from God. 